have Ms. Ninavaji here with us, who's a physical therapist and an athletic trainer, right? Um, to chat with us kind of about her career and how she ended up where she is. So thank you so much for giving your time today and I'll let you get started. So my name is Mary. Uh, like she said, I'm a physical therapist, athletic trainer. I received my undergrad degree from Marywood University in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and then went on to get my PT degree from Rutgers. Um, so I'm currently working as a physical therapist in an outpatient clinic in Denville, New Jersey, Carroll Physical Therapy. Um, I initially, I got my athletic training certification first, but I kind of jumped right into PT school after that. Um, and, you know, I like being active, enjoying spending time with my family and friends. I got a dog over quarantine, so a little puppy that I love hanging out with. Um, but I really got into this field because I played sports my whole life, really enjoy being active and and work being active with others and helping foster that relationship with, with exercise and activity. Um, so what is physical therapy? Uh, I'm gonna just read our vision statement from our national organization. It's transforming society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. So really what we're doing is we're trying, depending on who that patient is and what their movement levels are, we're trying to optimize that, make that better to help create a better quality of life for them. So we are licensed healthcare professionals through each state uh, and movement specialists. So we do an extensive background education in movement sciences, anatomy, physiology, biology, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, we look at our patients and break down what their impairments are. So do they have strength deficits, range of motion issues, things like that to, to then apply to how is that lim limiting them in their activities or recreation or, or exercise or anything that they like to do. So we create that individualized plan of care for each patient. So what that means is if you have an 85 year old patient who just need, just wants to be able to go walk at the grocery store for five minutes, walk up three stairs to get into her house, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna make that person run on the treadmill. So I'm gonna focus on what they need versus if I have an athlete that wants to get back to soccer in a few months, their plan of care is gonna be really different. So really listening to what that patient wants. And, and you may have an older patient that wants to run. Like you, you, don't, you can't assume what each patient wants. So you have to really listen to them and, and create a plan for them. My, everybody can hear me, right? I'm not talking too fast. I have that problem when I talk with my hands. So <laughs> I'll slow it down a little if I need to. Um, so there's different settings. I'm an outpatient. So I work more with orthopedic type injuries. So just uh, sprains, strains, muscle injuries, back pain, um, post-surgical stuff, joint replacements, things like that. But you, as a PT, you can work in acute care, which is in the hospital, subacute rehab, which is when patients are discharged from the hospital but aren't really ready to go home. Uh, skilled nursing facilities where older patients or any other patient needs required care from medical staff in those facilities. Uh, School-based, so PTs in the school. Inpatient rehab, which is kind of extensive they're working with a team of occupational therapy and speech and they're getting rehab many hours a day. Uh, and then home health. So when patients are kind of homebound, post-surgery, they can't drive, they can't leave, a PT can come into their house to make sure they're safe. Now, that's how you're kind of prepared to practice after PT school to go into any of those settings. After that, you can, your continuing ed can focus on specializing even more. So specializing in geriatrics, pediatrics, cardiopulmonary conditions, women's health or public health, uh, orthopedics, neurology, so issues with the brain like stroke, spinal cord, uh, sports, and clinical electrophysiology. So you can kind of continue to grow in and build your practice based on what you decide to do after you graduate, which is another reason I really liked PT is that you're not bound to one thing forever. You can kind of change and specialize and, and continue as you're growing as a practitioner to change what you're doing. Uh, to be a PT, the, the bones of it, though, you need to want to help people, you want to work with people, be comfortable being close to patients and working on them physically, because I, I know some pe people are like, I don't want to touch feet. You, you get over that pretty quickly in PT school. Um, and then just believing that movement is medicine and that you can help people uh, by being an active listener and, and listening to what they want to say and trying to optimize how they can move. You're also dedicating yourself to being a lifetime learner. So you're learning new tricks, traits, and continuing your education as you go. Um, so how do you get there? How's that process? So the undergraduate degree, you need a four-year degree. Some programs you can, if you know, like right now you wanna be a PT and you won't, you're gonna start 
undergrad after senior year going on that track, there are programs that have uh, a three plus three. So you enter as a freshman and you kind of go right through into your PT degree. I didn't do that because I didn't know I wanted to be a PT right away. So I finished my undergrad degree first and then I applied to the three year PT degree. So typically it's a, a seven year process. You're four years of undergrad and then you're three years of grad school. So in undergrad, you can really have any major you want. Uh, in my cohort, I had uh, classmates that were graphic design majors and then they decided to go back to PT school. So you, as long as you hit the prerequisite courses, which are your basic sciences, and that like biology, anatomy, chem, physics, sometimes calc and stats, um, other times psychology degrees, each school kind of has their different prerequisite requirements. Um, as long as you hit those, you it's just that you have graduated with a four-year degree. And then you go into that PT degree, where you'll then dive deeper into some of those sciences as well. Um, to know which schools have PT programs, you can look online. There's also kind of a common app for PT school where they have all your prerequisite courses based on the school because you need to graduate from an accredited university in order to sit for your licensing exam. So there's a board that that determines that the school is able to prep students for PT. There's certain requirements they have to meet. So then once you get all all through your undergrad and you're applying to those schools, you'll have to do some observation hours, get some letters of rec, uh, do some essays and other supplemental information that the school may require. And, and there is kind of to where you see if, okay, this PT is kind of what I wanna do. So you can get out there all through undergrad, which is something I, I wish I knew a little earlier in my undergrad education that, that it, there's no time constraint on it. You can start observing, keep a record of it, and, and those hours will count. I also worked towards the, the end of my undergrad degree in a PT clinic. So I was an aide helping out with like cleaning and, and learning that way. Um, and then those hours counted too. So it was kind of like a job all building my experience that way. And, and just another tip that was really helpful to me, PT can be kind of a small world. People end up knowing each other, went to school with whoever. So you can treat all these opportunities as kind of like a job interview whether you're working for them or not. So then you come in and you want to observe, you come in and observe me. I'm going to vouch for you when you're going to PT school and you need a letter of rec from a physical therapist that I worked with you. So it, it's kind of good to, to network really early any, as well. So when you're in PT school, you now you get through all that undergrad stuff, now you're in PT. You have now more clinical versus just school work. So there's a didactic portion where you're doing all those courseworks at intensive science and, and PT specific stuff. And then you have full-time clinical rotations as well. So that's where you'll be working for like 40 hours a week or whatever under a licensed physical therapist. So in those settings, you'll, you'll have your hands on patients. You're not just observing. So you're working closely with, you're having your own schedule, a portion of that and, and really getting used to practicing and how working with a live per person is different than you know, your textbook patient and how people will kind of change and present. Um, that way is also where you'll decide where you want to practice. Because I, I stuck with orthopedics and that's what I kind of felt I wanted to do. But I have plenty of friends that were like, I don't want to go in the hospital. I don't want to go into subacute rehab. And that's where they ended up. Because after they had that experience, they loved it. And, and that's where they ended up. Now in order to, now you're through PT school. Now what do you do? In order to actually become the physical therapist, you have to take another exam, a licensing exam. That's a national board exam. Then you will have to have the DPT degree. You'll have to have a CPR certification and you will, um, and then apply for a license in the state. So that's in order to protect the public. You can search me online and make sure that I have, uh, it's to keep the public safe. So you could search and make sure that I have never had any sanctions against me or anything like that. And you can do that with any healthcare provider. Um, and then you have to pass that exam. Now, getting that DPT degree, that has recently changed. Uh, it used to be a master's degree and actually first a bachelor's degree. But as the requirements to be a healthcare provider have continued to grow, and we also have direct access now in New Jersey, meaning you don't need to see a doctor before you come see me. You could just come in directly. Uh, so that way the, the requirements to make sure we're safe 
have also continued to grow, uh, like making sure we have a lot of pathology courses determining when we need to refer people out. But by any means, if somebody has a master's in physical therapy, they are perfectly qualified to treat you because it really comes down to a matter of credits that you took in grad school, getting it to that next level of doctorate versus master's. Um, they have the clinical experience and they're honestly more valuable because they've been practicing for longer. And everybody has to con do continuing education credits, 30 credits for every two years to continue to keep their license active. So every PT is doing that, no matter if their edu educational degree. Uh, so you that if I send you my business card, it says Marion Navaji, D PT, DPT. So that PT is saying that I'm licensed in New Jersey to practice. I've maintained all the requirements. I can do my continuing ed, I have my CPR. And then the DPT is my education. Any questions for me so far for anybody? We're good? Okay. Now, just a day in the life as a PT. So as I said, I work in outpatient. So my schedule will be, I'll have different conditions all day, really. I'll see about two patients an hour because we're a very manual clinic here. So we'll spend a lot of hands-on time with our patients. Um, so I'll start with somebody that today, my schedule looks like I have, I can run through it. Somebody that's coming in post ACL surgery, an older gentleman who, who injured his arm golfing, uh, total hip replacement, neck pain with radiating pain down her arm, um, postural issues, so they're having some, some neck pain when they're at the computer, somebody that had an ankle sprain, and then somebody that's just having difficulty running uh, due to knee pain. So that's just my, that's my morning. So I can, I have a wide range of stuff, so it keeps it really exciting, no day is the same. Um, I'm not bored doing the same thing because I'm, I'm changing it up, everybody's a little different. So when I get a, like a nice balance of, of different types of people too, so some people that wanna be like, they wanna work on squat form. And then I have people that are just working on trying to get some range of motion back. So every, and then the best part of my job is that I, like I said, I have that ACL patient. I'm gonna work with him all the way through. Now he can't really do much. He's walking a little um, impaired, but he wants to snowboard and ski again. So working with him kind of all the way through that is one of the most rewarding parts of my job, uh, especially with people who, who have really couldn't walk at all and using the assistive device and then getting them to a place where they can do things that they didn't really think that they could. Um, but my main job is really listening to what they value and, and catering to what they need. Uh, as a therapist, you're kind of these, it could be a challenging road because patients are in pain. So they're not their best selves. They're not always where they want to be. So you, you're a coach, a therapist, a cheerleader, you're helping to keep them motivated, and then you're a healthcare provider all in one. Uh, so just trying to keep them involved in, in the treatment as well. Uh, the projected forecast for the career is really promising, I think, I love it. Um, there's always, there's a lot of research coming out that movement is medicine, uh, and it's really helpful for a variety of conditions. There's recently a study about patients hospitalized with COVID and if they had physical therapy in the hospital when they were when they were really struggling, uh, their outcomes were better after compared to those who didn't. So that's just really great for our fields uh, and those getting in there and helping keeping people moving. Um, and it's just constantly updating. And like I said, you're a lifetime learner. The skills are changing and, and there's always being research done to progress the field. So you can always make yourself more effective and, and challenge yourself and get continuing certifications and things like that. Any questions for me? I would say, what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in the career? In the career, so challenges, is you're always uh, managing personalities too. So so there's a ton about pain science as well. So when, when somebody's in, you know, you have, things can change every day. So you can kind of be on your toes. Somebody could come in and they're feeling great. And then the next day something happened and, and they're way set back. And then now they're upset and, and unmotivated. So you have to kind of stay on your toes and, and really balance that. Um, and another additional challenging thing is, is always like the paperwork and the admin stuff, the, the not fun stuff where you got to work with insurance and, and, that billing part and, and managing your time because you also have to see a certain amount of patients a day in order to, to be able to keep your place going. So making sure that you, you're doing some time management stuff to get that done so you're not working the, all day long. Right. Well, it's interesting as far as even like 
keeping patients um, and having them come because it's a business as well. So mm -hmm. do you have any piece of the marketing? I'm just, as you're talking, do you have to market to, to people as well? Or are you basically able to just focus on what you need to do with the, the physical therapy part of it? Definitely the company does. Okay. Um, you're always kind of trying to market for yourself too. Like I'll, I'll communicate with doctors and, and athletic trainers and the schools and, and friends of family members and, and try to advocate for our clinic. Um, but also like our, we're a smaller company uh, with fewer employees. So we have to work to kind of get that out with our marketing as well. And, and we really go by a lot of our stuff is word of mouth and referrals from patients, past patients locally. But yes, we do kind of marketing campaigns where we'll do like Facebook and blast emails and things like that. So you have a question that oh. came in. Can you see it or would you want me to read it for you? I could oh, I could see it. Okay, so do some PTs work with certain age groups or is it just divided up by types of injury? So depending on what kind of PT you are, so if you're going into pediatrics then you're gonna work mainly with children um, in schools or you can work in an outpatient clinic. There's PTs that'll work in the NICU with, with babies. Um, if there's, and like really young children and working on neck control and things like that. Um, but in my clinic, it's, I can see any patient, not specific body type or like body injury. I'll see from feet all the way up to the head. Um, so PTs, depending on what setting you work in, uh, I would say you could work with certain age groups, um, but really, and not even type of injury. Sometimes there's, so for vertigo, you can have an advanced specialty in that. So I won't typically treat that as much because a coworker is special, specializes in that. Um, but I could. So really, it depends on where you work, I would say. Great. Do you have any advice for students who are looking to just get more of a sense of the field? What maybe some courses they could take in high school or some types of things they could do maybe this summer even to give them more exposure? Coursework, I would say definitely like an anatomy and physiology type course or a, if I don't know if I didn't have it at my high school, a kinesiology or an exercise physiology type class, because that's really where I took a kinesiology class first year of undergrad. And that's where I decided to change mm -hmm. my path because it was really cool, really interesting on, on looking at biomechanics and things like that. Um, but in terms of seeing if PT is what you would like, get out, just email email PT clinics, or if you know somebody that knows somebody, ask to go in and shadow and see if it's something that you would like. Yeah. Um, and anything like as far as recommendations for maybe schools, whether undergrad or accelerated programs, anything that you would suggest for them to look for as they do research for that, you know, potential major, that career in those schools? So I'm, I'm just gonna actually pull up and see. I only know a few of the programs off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. Just more things like when they right. go on the website or, you know, certain maybe curriculums or like you mentioned, it needs to be accredited. <laughs> yeah. So like you could go at it. CAPT is I could send over some links to you guys, too, if you want them. Um, and PTCAS is that common app for PT school. That'd be great. If you could have that. All of the requirements based on the school, what programs are accredited um, and what each school. It's like a huge chart that kind of breaks down based on the class. Um, and then just searching, even if like, you know, it's what you want to do, search those three plus three DPT programs. And that will usually come up with what schools have it, but the accrediting agency should have that too. Um, definitely looking at, because each program is different kind of how they do it and how many clinical hours they have or what research specialties they are. So at Rutgers, we were uh, kind of a more neuro based and we did four clinical experiences, which I really liked was a little bit more opportunities to do every setting um, where some schools may have three, but they're a little longer. Um, so those things you can see when you search the specific school, they'll have their curriculum up and kind of how it looks, whether you're going through the summers or not um things like that that may impact your choice i have a question so for some of our students who are looking to intern or shadow is there something that you look for from those students as far as when you allow them to come in and work with you um are there things that you look for characteristics um and then what are the expectations when you are shadowing like what kind of things can they get involved with 
from that experience. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so requirements right now with COVID, it's a little tricky because we have to limit the amount of people currently in the clinic. Typically it would be, usually it's not really any problem at all. Um, we would just kind of schedule, but now we're, our hours are limited because we're just trying to make sure that we don't have a certain number of bodies in here at once. Um, so, but in terms of like requirements before you come in, just really actually be interested in, in coming in. I wouldn't say like, oh, you have to do X, Y, Z to come in. Um, but when you're here, you know, being interested, asking, asking questions, no matter if you, like, there's no dumb questions is how I feel like you just ask how, what's going on, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Um, and then when you're here really shadowing, you're not required to do anything. I may be like, oh, can you hand me that pillow? You know, like help me out with some other things, but not required to do anything. Um, here, if you would like to, at our clinic, and I think many others, if you wanted to work and get some exposure hours while doing that, you'd be more in charge of like cleaning up some tables, cleaning equipment down, helping uh, grab equipment and putting it away for us, things like that, checking patients in, like checking their temperatures and things like that, um, doing those types of things to help us out. But then it can be kind of as much as you want in terms of you can hang with like doing your job and hanging with me and asking why you're doing that with this patient and and things like that and it's a good experience to be able to start talking to patients and be like what's going on like how have you been feeling and kind of getting that learning how to build the rapport with patients before you're kind of have to you know you could just get that practice like anything it's a skill learning how to like talk to people and, and see how they're doing so kind of getting that exposure as well <laughs> You mentioned just as far as the states, are does different states have different requirements? And if you were to go to a college in a different state, how did, was that, would that work? So the different states, in terms of schooling and the licensing exam, that doesn't matter okay. across the state, among the states. Um, it really, the rules per state in terms of getting your license are slightly mm -hmm. different. Many states are very similar. You have to do continuing education credits. It's just a matter of how many. Um, so each state kind of, and then states will have different rules in terms of what you could do to practice. So there's like a technique called dry needling. So it's using kind of acupuncture needles. New York, you can do it. New Jersey, you can't. Um, they're constantly kind of, we have that association that kind of keeps you up to date on things like that and helps you uh, try it. They're fighting to get it back for us. So like, we can't do it right now, but they, maybe we can. So the licensure kind of depends totally on your state. So if you go to school in a different state, but you plan to work in another, I would always say try to get at least one internship in that state. So then you can learn how to practice the way they practice in that state. Because in my, in, I went to Rutgers, so we had a course on the legislation in New Jersey and just how to read it. So, and kind of where to look for things. So they can, you can apply that skill to whatever state you're going to. And it's always available online, but it was, for me, I had uh, friends that planned to move to North Carolina. They did a rotation down there to make sure that they kind of know what those subtle differences. That's great advice. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else have questions at all? All right. Good. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for, so for again, your time. This was uh, excellent. You know, we all learned so much. I took a lot of notes here. <laughs> so <laughs> that we could, uh, you know, certainly share with our students. So, and the nice thing is it's going to be recorded. So something, again, that we could show to our classes. So we appreciate that as well. No problem. And you could just shoot me an email if I missed anything or have any follow-up questions. All right, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great day, you guys. All right. Thank bye. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.